Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Revival Sunday. Please stand with me and let's sing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. of mercy whispers of love this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long perfect submission all is at singing let's sing victory in jesus i heard an old old story i heard an old old story how the savior came from glory how he gave his life on calvary to save Thank you. 
please remain standing for our offering. All right. Thank you, Brother Tom. You may be seated. Great singing this morning. We've got a great crowd this morning. We're glad you're here for our first morning of our revival here. So we're glad you're here today. Anytime first-time attenders that I didn't see come in, anybody at all, first time? All right, great. If you're first time at home, you could put up a comment. And we could, we'll see that you're there. We're glad you're joining us today. And also, we're going to have our uh, special for our offering coming up. So uh, thankful how the Lord's blessed in our offerings here during this time. And uh, so uh, don't forget, we got our offering plate in the back for the folks here inside. And then also for our love offering, make sure you put that on your envelope that it's for a love offering for Brother Thompson for our revival service. And uh, put that in the plate in the back, too. And for you at home, uh, go on to our Tithely app. And uh, if you'd like to give to that, also there's a place where you can uh, designate a love offering there. And we'll put that to uh, give to Brother Thompson. So uh, if you'd like to do that at home, uh, make sure you separate that and uh, make a separate entry for that along with your tithes and offerings. We're thankful for your faithfulness and we're thankful, looking forward to having a great service today. So uh, let's uh, have a, uh, let's have a word of prayer. I'll pray first and then we'll have a special. Almost for, Thank you very much. Uh, we'll, and then we'll pray here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day and we uh, thank you for the beautiful day you've given us. We're thankful for the great crowd today. We're just looking and uh, just for a great service, Lord, and uh, just pray that you'd bless our services. Uh, just touch our hearts, open our hearts to your word, Lord. And also, with the offering, we're thankful for the offerings that uh, our people have given and been so uh, faithful. And I uh, just pray that you bless the offerings at this time to further your work and to see more people come to know you as Lord and Savior. We're thankful for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
by so long if ye even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thine house. They will be still praising thee. Selah, blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, and whose heart are the ways of them. Through the valley of Baca, make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength, every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, see. my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly, O Lord of hosts. Blessed is the man who trusteth in thee. Well, we're that is. Uh, Brother Tom's going to come lead us in another song in just a moment, but I want to introduce the uh, Thompson family today. We're grateful for them being with us for the start of our revival. And I believe it'll be a great blessing to us. So after he leads us in a song, we're going to have the spe- they're going to do some specials, and then he's going to come to preach. But when he comes to preach, as is customary in our church, would you please stand in honor of God's man and the word of God as they come to preach uh, today? So we're looking forward to a great service, and we're so grateful that you're here today. Wasn't that a blessed song there? Great, great. Wonderful to see kids serving the Lord. And what a blessing it is. So I appreciate so much you being here today. I think you're in for a real treat and blessing. We've been praying much for this revival, and I trust that God will speak to all of our hearts. Tom, would you please stand? Let's sing a friend I have called Jesus, whose love is strong and true. A friend I have called Jesus, whose love is strong. like 
his great love when sorrows clouds overtake me and break upon my head when life seems worse than useless and I would better dead I take my grief to Jesus then nor do I go in vain for heavenly hope he gives that cheers like sunshine after rain it's just like Jesus to pull the clouds away it's just like Jesus to keep me day by day it's just like Jesus all along the way it's just like be seated. When a dollar's worth a dime and the world runs out of time, you can count on this old book still being true. From the Lord it was conceived to spirit breeze it's the only perfect guide for me and you so hold to the book god said it and it's so hold to the book and never let it go let it be your counsel every day and hold to the book it will never pass away When your loved ones pass you by and you want to sit and cry, then the Bible points you to the sinner's friend. When you ask him as your own, you will never be alone. He has promised to be with you to the end. So hold to the book, God sent it and it's so. Counsel every day and hold to the book, it will never pass away. And hold to the book, it will never pass away. upon its pages always will remain the word of God will never fail you its timelessness is sure and it always will endure the word of God is a light unto my path those strongest men will fail God's word will last. Though nations will rise and fall, God's word outlives them all. It will stand the test of time. 
for its author is divine. I will proudly call it mine, the Word of God. Now Satan tries to stamp it out and to change it all about. But like a mighty fortress, it stands the battle's rage. The laws of earth may crumble or change with fallen man. But with each change, God's word remains while kingdoms fade away. The word of God is a light unto my path. Though the strongest men will fail, God's word will last. Though nations rise and fall, God's word outlives them all. It will stand the test of time, for its author is divine. And I will proudly call it mine, the word of God. Though nations rise and fall, God's word outlives them all. It will stand the test of time, for its author is divine. I will proudly call it mine. The word of God. And aren't you glad for the Word of God upon which we can build a sure foundation? All right, and I, I know that this is your normal habit, but I'm going to read in just a minute from the Scripture. I want to talk to you for a couple minutes. So thank you for standing in the calisthenics, but you may be seated. And while you're being seated, grab your Bible, and you can begin to turn to Revelation 4, but don't stand yet. We'll get there in just a moment, and we will stand and show public respect for the Scriptures in a moment. Oh, kiddos, I guess you already know. Um, you can be dismissed. And um, somebody's back there to check IDs to make sure that, that um, you don't leave when you're not supposed to. <laughs> all right. And the rest of you, you're stuck. And I'm glad you are. So we'll be in Revelation chapter 4. By the way, if you're not familiar with finding places in the Scriptures, Revelation is the very last book in the Bible. So go all the way to the back and you'll be able to find it. The only one past that is the book of Concordance. If you go to Concordance, you went too far, take a left. And uh, you'll come to the book of Revelation. In just a minute, we'll look at several verses together. Hey, let me just say real quickly, um, it's a privilege for us, my family, to be able to be here. And honestly, I mean that. We count it a great honor to be able to be here at Capital City and looking forward to the week that we have together this week. Um, now, I think I, I, I kind of um, peeked and looked around when Pastor had asked or somebody was asking if there's anybody here for the first time, and I didn't see anybody. But if by chance you're not a regular attender here at Capital City, um, I'm, I'm a guest as well. This is my first time. I should have raised my hand, I guess. So from, if you're a guest, from one guest to another, I say welcome. I'm glad that you're here. And just in case you don't know, this is a um, special week here at the church in the sense that we're having um, services a little more often than what is typically the case. So we're meeting together this morning, like you all normally do, and then tonight at 5.30, at 5.30, and then um, the rest of this week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we will meet at 7 o'clock in the evening. So I'd um, love for you to come to every service that you possibly can. By the way, the um, pastor hasn't said anything to me, so I, d I don't know what the normal habit is of you all. That is, there may be a number of you who usually just come on Sunday morning and then maybe sometimes on Sunday night, but not real often. And if you have special services, um, you come or don't come and it kind of is hit and miss. I don't know what your normal habit is, but I mean this sincerely. I sure, would, I sure think it'd be helpful to you and it'd be beneficial to the church if every person who's here this morning was back tonight. So make, make your plans, even if it's not your normal habit, even if it's not your normal habit, come back tonight at 5.30, and in each service, we'll have special music like we did this morning, and we'll sing together, enjoy your congregational singing, and then we'll take some time to look at the scriptures, because we, we do believe, I'm thoroughly convinced, 
for a number of reasons that this book really does come from God and that everything that's in it is, is meant for us and it's meant for us to learn about Him and about ourselves and about eternity and about how to live at peace and to live at peace for eternity and to live at peace now and how to exist the way God originally intended for His creation to exist. This is really, sincerely, this is a firm foundation upon which you can build your life. There, there is authority for your life and that authority is, of course, God and His Word and He reveals that to us here in the Scriptures. So, um, look each service at something from the Scriptures. So, um, I, wa I want you to come is what I'm saying and I'd love for you to be able to, even if you're a guest, or not a regular attender, come tonight at 5.30, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And then real quickly, in case we've not yet had the opportunity to meet, let me introduce myself. Some guys I met in the back, and they had masks on, so I don't know what they actually look like, um, other than their eyes. It'll throw me off a little bit. But my name is Tim Thompson. My wife is Brittany. Brittany, do you mind just standing and giving the Miss America wave? Okay, this is my wife. Brittany, and she and I have been married for almost 20 years, and God has blessed us with three boys. Seth, who sang first, he's our oldest. Um, he's 13, and then Samuel is seven, he sang just a minute ago. And then Asher is five years old, and then we have a baby on the way. Another boy will be coming in January, God willing, and his name is Isaac. And uh, we've, already, we've already named him, and I reserve the right to change my mind between now and... <laughs> January, but we've been calling him Isaac, and so um, God willing, um, with everything being safe and happening the way it's supposed to, that he'll come um, in January, first part of January, so we're excited about that. We travel around um, 11 months, 10 and a half, 11 months out of the year. We're on the road. We live in a fifth wheel travel trailer. We're parked just down the road right now at the uh, RV park, and um, we base out of Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, we're home about three or four, maybe five weeks a year. The rest of the time, we're on the road and um, traveling to different churches and preaching in meetings like what we had the privilege of being able to preach at your church this week. Last week, we were up in Michigan in Grand Rapids, and um, it's warmer here than it is there. So whatever you feel about this morning's temperature, it was, it's warmer here than it is there. And uh, next week, we're actually in Indianapolis again, which is a little bit unusual. Seldom do we get to stay in the same city for two weeks in a row. And then after that, we'll be in Kentucky. And then after that is Thanksgiving week, and we'll go visit Brittany's family. She's from Southeast Georgia. And um, then we're somewhere else after that. So uh, we may chat a little bit more about, about the schedule throughout the week. But just, just to kind of introduce ourselves to you, since we've not yet had the privilege of having any conversation past, hello, my name is, what's yours? Um, so, hey, by the way, um, I, I, this is a terrible, terrible excuse, but I, I struggle with names, just remembering. So if we've met already and if after the service I see you and I say, hey, brother or um, sister, what that is, is it's my key phrase for I'm sorry I've forgotten your name. And if you'd be so kind as to remind me, I would greatly appreciate it. And I don't mind reminding you of my name at all. So, um, so feel free to talk. And we do enjoy chatting. So, so after the services um, this week, we would love to get to know you a little bit better. Okay. Let's, uh, let's get to the reason why we've gathered together this morning. We're going to look together at Revelation chapter 4, and uh, we're going to read two verses at the end of this chapter. And I want to set up the scenario for you before we read the scriptures, so you can keep your seats for a moment, but we will stay in when we read in a moment. But let me kind of set up, set up the picture. It's helpful anytime you're reading through the, anytime you're reading through the scriptures to, um, if, if you're reading a narrative, that is, if you're reading a story, if you can let your mind see what it is that's going on. Uh, if you can put yourself in the story in the sense of feeling the emotions and looking around and seeing the sights and smelling the smells and being aware of who else is around you in the story, it helps things come to life in a special way. Now in Revelation, we have kind of a special situation. Revelation 4 is written as a narrative. It's written as a story. However, it's a narrative that has not yet taken place. You may be familiar with the fact that the book of Revelation was given to us to reveal, thus the name of the book, Revelation, to reveal to us things that are going to come in the future. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, namely his return when he is set up as the king of kings and everybody knows it at that point. 
Okay. In Revelation, the first three chapters, we have three chapters that are um, letters that are written to different churches. And then in chapter number four, we have what I believe to be what we oftentimes refer to as the rapture, where those who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior are taken off the earth. And then a scene unfolds. Now, we're going to read it as if it's already happened, but it has not yet happened. In fact, if you're a child of God, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, you will be a part of what we're about to read. And so this kind of gives you a sneak peek into what is going to happen in the future after Christ comes again. And we have this scene unfold in heaven that is uh, absolutely majestic in its, in its nature. Just l- let me set it up for you. Um, what we have revealed to us is this. That in heaven, there will, be a, uh, there will be a large group of people, those who have trusted Christ as Savior. We don't know how many, probably with the naked eye, you couldn't even guesstimate. Thousands upon thousands who through the ages have accepted Christ as Savior. And they all stand in a group of people and everybody is looking in one direction. And they're looking towards a platform and a throne. Now the Bible doesn't say specifically what this looks like. In my mind, the way I see it is a series of like 20 or 30 steps Again, the Bible doesn't say this. In my brain, I see them built out of, uh, out of granite or marble. And it leads up to a large platform. And on the platform is a throne. The Bible does say this. And the throne, in the throne is seated God himself. Surrounding the throne, there are beasts that are crying as they fly. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Also, up on the platform and near the throne, there are 24, the Bible calls them elders. Now, we don't know exactly who these men are. I believe that they represent the saved of the earth, but we don't know exactly who they are. We do know that they were men who in their lives had served God faithfully because they were given reward. They had crowns on their heads from their, for their rewards for their service to the Lord. And so 24 men are surrounding the throne. And that's where we pick up in Revelation chapter 4. We're going to read verses 10 and 11 and see what happens in this picture. Now, I will tell you, for some of you, you're going to have to dust off the imagination a little bit. But it really will help you to see the significance of what takes place if you will watch it in your mind as we read it here in Revelation 4. If you're physically able, please stand as we show our public respect for the scriptures and allow the blood to, your, to, to flow to your brain for a few minutes while, uh, while you're standing here. Revelation 4, verse 10 says this. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that lived forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created now I'd like to read it one more time and this time I'm going to invite you not to read along with me but to allow yourself to see it as I read you're in the group Thousands upon thousands all around you are people, typically in a group of any size. There's elbows, there's whispering, there's other things going on. But in this, in this case, there's none of that. Every eye is fastened on what's taking place up on this platform in heaven. And God sits on the throne. And the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the, thro- uh, before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, as we come before you this morning, and we anticipate the day when we will be a part of what takes place, help us now, Father, please, to learn what you intend for us to learn from what will take place. Let our hearts be encouraged and our minds be enlightened. May our lives and the decisions of our lives reflect what it is 
that we learn this morning from your word. Please, Father, help me. I need your help. I confess it. I know it. And I ask you, please, to come and stir in the hearts of the people who have gathered together this morning, those who are watching online. I pray that you'd please help each of us to learn what it is that we need to. In Christ's name, I ask these things. Amen. Thank you for standing. Please be seated. I don't know if you're anything like I am, but I've come to the place now where I am um, weary of all of the uh, political advertisements that are going on. Uh, usually you get about six months of political advertisements before a general election. This year I think it's been three and a half years of uh, political advertisements that have gone on. And my mind, my body is just like, okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm, uh, Tuesday's coming and I'm, I'm I'm finished. I just can't hear anymore. Now, when I was younger, I, I enjoyed the excitement of a general election and the excitement of all of the speeches and everything. I've had a couple of occasions to go to a speech um, that's been given by someone of national um, clout. I've uh, gone to hear a uh, vice president who was running, a vice president in person, and I've always been interested in how much emphasis is given to the atmosphere in um, one of of these political events. Have you, ever, have you ever been to a political speech or anything like this before? If, if you have, then you know what I'm talking about. If not, let me kind of give you a picture. When I was in high school, I went to hear the vice president make a speech. He was coming to a junior college near where I lived. Now, I'm going to go ahead and date myself and tell you that the vice president at that time was Dan Quayle. And uh, he was coming to the city where I lived. And so I wanted to go hear him. I liked Mr. Quayle. I wanted to hear him speak. So I went to the gymnasium that they had set up for this event. And when I walked in, it didn't look much like a gymnasium outside of the wood floors. They had the bleachers out and everything. But at the end of the gymnasium, they had built a platform. And uh, they had off the edge of the platform a catwalk that went over to a side door, like what's over here on the church, only it was farther away. And uh, there were a, a good crowd, hundreds of people that had come. They, if I remember correctly, they had chairs on the floor, bleachers were out, people were standing, and we were all there because we wanted to hear the Vice President of the United States. Now, outside the building, there were people picketing his coming, but for the most part, inside the building, everybody came in order to hear Dan Quayle give a speech. That's, that's what we wanted to hear. He was Vice President, we wanted to hear him. Well, when I got in there, I realized that before you got to hear the main event, you had to go through all of the local politicians. So I'm, I'm out in the crowd, and I'm looking around, and I don't see Mr. Quayle up here anywhere. But they have a band up on the uh, platform and a bunch of local politicians who get up, and they'll stump and try to get you to vote for them and encourage you about going out and voting and kind of pumping up the crowd and everything. And that happened for 30 or 45 minutes, maybe an hour. Um, and then it was finally time for Mr. Quayle to speak. Well, we were very excited about Mr. Quayle speaking, and we looked around, and he wasn't anywhere in the building. So this gentleman comes up on the platform, and he comes up to the lectern, and he makes a statement kind of like this. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the Vice President of the United States of America. And a side door opens and down the catwalk walks Mr. Quayle. Well, when he comes into the building, everybody stood up and clapped and cheered and got excited. And he comes up to the lectern while we're clapping and cheering and waves to people and points like he actually knows any of the people and uh, does one of these numbers because he is a politician after all. But finally, everyone quiets down and he gives a speech. I don't remember anything, not anything about the speech, but I do remember all of the hoopla that, that led up to the speech. And it struck me sometime later about the introduction that was given to the vice president. Because everybody in the building was there to hear the vice president. So when the introduction was given, ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the vice president of the United States of America, the introduction was not given uh, as if you don't know who the vice president is. It wasn't a matter of, okay, now you guys may not know this, but Dan Quayle is the vice president of the, it wasn't that at all. This morning, pastor introduced me, but that's because you guys don't have a clue who I am. We've never met before, but with Mr. Quayle, it wasn't that case. The, the introduction was given more out of, uh, more out of respect for who he is or the position that he holds, not so much as that kind of introduction as if you don't know who he is. 
In other words, it was this person, because of the position they hold, we need to take a minute and introduce who they are. Okay. Now, in a much more significant sense this morning, not because you don't know who he is, but out of respect for who he is. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present to you your God. In Revelation chapter 4, we have a scene that unfolds that exalts the majesty on the throne. The whole picture is that of awe and wonder where a throne on a platform and beasts flying around the throne declaring the holiness of God and 24 elders who as one person fall down in worship before the throne and take the crowns off of their heads and cast them before the throne and they make a declaration of thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. It's a picture that exalts God. But what grabbed my attention from this passage was the statement that the 24 elders made. Verse number 11, the very first phrase they say, after they've fallen down and cast the crowns at his feet, they make this declaration. They say, thou art worthy, O Lord. Now this grabbed my attention just as I was kind of thinking through life and thinking through the way I thought about things and my perception about how I think a lot of other people think as well. And because of preaching that I've heard in my life. I've grown up in church and I've heard a lot of preaching in my life. And as a result of my hearing of preaching and just talking to people and just uh, thinking through how I think, it struck me how I think we've become very man-centered in the way that we think about life. Even in the way that we think about God, we become very us-centered in it. Here's here's what I mean. My thought about God and his work and creation and his interaction um, with humanity, his creation of the world, the sunshine that shines or the rain that falls, the uh, faithfulness of all of the seasons, When I think about God and about me, my mind always revolves everything that God has done around around me. That is, I always think of God and his goodness in relationship to how it is good to me. And And I find myself, and maybe you do too if you ever consider it, I always find myself in consideration of life and everything that happens in how it relates to me, even even when it comes to God. That is, I've become very man, me, centered. Um, Let me me see if I can illustrate it better for you. Um, I'm a preacher, and as a preacher, it is my God-given responsibility to tell you what God says from his word. Um, Now, There are things in the Bible where God says, hey, don't do this, it's wrong. And places where he says, this is what's right, this is what's good. You know this, right? So that that God God gives us instruction about bad and good, wrong and right. All right, now as a preacher, it's my responsibility to study the Bible and then to tell you whatever it is that God says about what is wrong and what is right. And I... I don't, don't take this wrong. I don't, I don't mean this in a mean, snarky way at all. But I'm supposed to tell you what God says about wrong and right without regard for how you might, how you might take it or what you think of it. I, I don't mean that in a mean-spirited way, but it, it's the truth. In other words, if God says something is wrong, I'm supposed to tell you, hey, this is, this is wrong whether I think you will agree with me or not. And if God says something is right, you're supposed to do it. I'm supposed to tell you, hey, God says this is right. You need to do it without regard to how you receive it. You understand that? So that's my responsibility. Okay, let me tell you what happens to me when I'm studying the Bible and I find where God says don't or do. I almost always find myself in preparing a message on the don'ts and do's 
of what God says is wrong or right, I always find myself searching around the scriptures or else thinking through logically about, okay, if I'm going to tell these people, don't do this or you need to do this, I need to find a way to tell them this, um, to show it to them in such a way so that, that uh, they see what the benefit will be to them if they follow what God says. So I will find in the scriptures or else I'll just think logically. If God says don't do something and I find myself preaching to people, say, hey, don't do this because when you don't do this, then, then your, your life will be better. And if you'll do this, then you, if God says to do this, then you need to do it because if you do it, then everything will go, go better for you. Um, do you guys know what hostess Twinkies are? Okay. Sometimes as a preacher, now forgive the silliness and the transparency, but sometimes as a preacher, I kind of feel like I'm holding a hostess Twinkie up in front of the people, and I'm saying, hey, you see this right here? This is the blessing of God. <laughs> oh, this is the blessing of God. And if you want the blessing of God, do you know what you do? You don't do the things God says not to do. And if you don't think, do the things that God says not to do, do you know what you get? The blessing. And if you'll do the things God says to do, do you know what you receive? Oh, oh, oh. the blessings. And all oh, the blessings, mm, they're good. Mm, mm, mm. I've tasted them before, and you will really like them. And if you want the blessings, then you obey God. And if you obey God, you get the blessings. Are you ready? Go serve God. Go serve God, and you can have the blessings. Okay, now again, forgive the silliness, please. But that's kind of, as a preacher, sometimes how I feel like I have to present things is that I have to show to you how it benefits you if you'll obey God. Now, let me ask you a question. Does God promise blessings to people who live in accordance to his word? Yes or no? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all things will be added unto you that you need. Correct? So that the, the Bible does say, as we obey, then God then will bless. And there are promises in Scripture from God. So that it's not wrong for me to expect God to bless when I live in obedience. Okay, but let me tell you something. When I read in Revelation chapter 4, verse number 11, the phrase, thou art worthy, O Lord, it brought to my mind the fact that the worthiness of God for obedience is not based upon what it is that I receive from God it's based upon the fact that he is God in the first place. In other words, my not doing the things that God says don't do or my doing the things that God says to do should not be at the foundation level based upon the fact of what I can receive. But it ought to be based if it is at the foundational level. It ought to be based upon the fact that he is God. Well, somebody says, Tim, I mean, honestly, and I hope you're thinking, what difference does it make? If I obey God because of the blessings, or if I obey God uh, because he's God, then what difference, what difference does it make? Either way, aren't I obeying God? Okay. Now think, stay with me for a second. Here's the problem. The problem is, is that if my obedience to God is based upon the blessings that I receive from being obedient, then the moment that what I receive from the Lord doesn't match up to what I feel like I can get if I go my own way, then the temptation to go my own way is going to be huge in my life. Okay, but please catch this. Please get this. This is so important. But if my decision point at, of life, if the engine of why I choose what I choose begins at the fact that he is worthy because he's God, then it does not matter what my perception of what I receive is. Because if I'm sick, he's worthy. And if I'm healthy, he's worthy. If I am poor, he is worthy. If I am rich, 
He is worthy if my friends despise me. He is worthy if all men love me. He is worthy. If everything goes the way that I want it to, he's worthy. If circumstances in life press against me and tear my heart out, he is still worthy because he is God. And his worthiness is not based upon what it is that I can receive. His worthiness is based upon who he is. Okay. So this makes a huge difference in my life. Now, the, the men here, the 24 elders, mentioned that he's worthy of glory, honor, power. Uh, just real quickly, um, glory is to have a good opinion, a praise. Um, God is worthy of being praised. That is, it's right. Well, somebody says, yeah, Brother Tim, and I do. Every time something good happens to me, I make sure to stop and praise the Lord. Good. Good. But his worthiness of praise is not based upon what it is that you receive. His worthiness of praise, of our having a good opinion of him, is based upon the fact that he's God. Which means, now stick with me for a second, because you've got to kind of think through this. Which means sometimes it may be that I'm praising the Lord with a broken heart. Because he's worthy. Not because my circumstances... Um, make me feel good and there may be times in my life where I have to remind myself and remember that he is worthy because he's God and I have a good opinion hey let me ask you a question do you don't answer out loud but do you praise God I mean purposefully with from your heart with your mouth do you praise God you say yeah brother Tim every time we sing praise him praise him Jesus our blessed redeemer um, I, I praise the Lord Okay, that, that's, that's good. You ought to. I, I, hope, I hope you sing from your heart when you sing congregational singing. By the way, let me just kind of say this as an aside, and it really is an aside, but I was thinking about it this morning, so I'm going to say it. Um, Brittany was playing in the offertory, and there was no plates being passed because we're not doing that right now. But I thought to myself, man, what a blessed time to be able to listen and to think through the words of the song and just worship God because he's worthy of it when music is being played like that. Yeah, he's worthy, he's worthy of it. Do you praise the Lord? I mean, sincerely, from your heart. When, when, when you wake up in the morning and whether it's sunshine or your rain, God, you're worthy of praise. I pray that he's good. That, that's something that ought to be done. Praise, he's also worthy of honor. That is having first place, having the place of priority, prominence. What he wants is what I want. Um, honor means to, to uh, be lifted up. The idea is that, that what is important to them is important to him, is important to me. Um, Brittany, my wife, is, has a place of honor in my life. We've been married for 20, almost 20 years, and I love my wife um, very much. What Brittany thinks and wants matters to me. If, if, if this week you got sick and went to the hospital, and if it were allowable, um, for me to come see you, I, I would count it a privilege to be able to come and see and pray with you about your health. I, I mean, I would. Now, if you were sick nigh unto death in the hospital, and at the same time my wife was sick nigh unto death in the hospital, well, God bless you and keep you, but I'm going to be with my, uh, with my wife. Why? Because of the value that she has in my life. Okay, please stay with me, and please don't shoot darts at me about this. This is not a backhanded arm twist. It's not. But I want you to think because if the Bible doesn't impact your living, then it's not doing what God intended for it to do. Amen. Almost every Sunday morning when I'm in revival meetings, I take time in the front part of the service like I did this morning and I say, hey, this week we're having revival meetings. I want you to come. Even if you don't normally come, come tonight and come the rest of the week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Come every night. This is meant for you. It's going to be a help. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. All right. I say that because I believe it's true. But I will tell you, there's a sense in which if we recognize the fact that thou art worthy, O Lord, and you're worthy of honor, that is, what you think and want matters, then I wouldn't even need to say anything about it. 
And you say, Brother Tim, isn't that, isn't that kind of like an arm twist about, about that? Okay, I, I'm not even saying that you should come to every service. I'm not, because I'm not God. I'm just saying, if you recognize the fact that God is worthy, why don't you just ask God if he wants you to? And I mean it. And then obey. If he says no, don't come, then don't. Okay, but listen. If God is worthy of honor, a first place, then his opinion matters. Well, you say, Brother Tim, I've heard you preach already. It's not worth it. It's not <laughs> worth it. Hey, listen, feel sorry for my wife. She listens to me preach all the time. Honestly, if this week were about me, then you'd be right. But I'm the guy coming up and introducing. I'm not the, I'm not the main event. This is about our God. And he is worthy of glory, of honor, of power. That is your strength, your life, your ability, who you are, what you have, everything about you. God is worthy of you giving it to him. It makes sense. It fits. He has that worth because of who he is. Well, somebody says, okay, Brother Tim, if I give God praise and if I give God honor and if I give God power, my life, um, if I do all that, Brother Tim, can you promise me? Can you say to me with confidence, can you take me to somewhere in the Bible that will, that will let me live at rest knowing that everything in my life will come out better or for the good if I give God praise and I give God first place and I give God my life? If I do that, Brother Tim, then will you tell me that everything will turn out right? Friend, what I will say to you is you are missing the point. The point is not what I can receive. The point is, thou art worthy, O Lord. Now, if this morning I were to... Um, stand up and begin to preach and tell you to turn to Revelation chapter 4. And all of a sudden, the side door over here opens up and in walked an entourage of people. And somebody in a dark suit came up and pushed me out of the way and said, ah, ladies and gentlemen, something special for you this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present to you the President of the United States of America. And in walked Mr. Trump. Now, regardless of what you think of him as a person, or his policies, out of respect for the position that he holds as President of the United States of America, I would, and I think you would too, I would stand and I would clap because he's the President of the United States. How much greater then when someone of no significance stands before you and says, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you God. We may not stand and clap, but my brothers and sisters, it ought to cause us to bow our hearts, our heads, and our knees and declare with 24 elders, Thou art worthy, O Lord. And if you live your life from this foundation, that He is worthy, then friend, it matters not what circumstances come at you. Your choice will be pleasing to God because you live based upon the fact that he is worthy. So how about it? Is that your foundation? Is that your beginning point? Is that the determining factor of your life? Thou art worthy? Well, I'm telling you, he is. And if it's not, 
been the great thing about our God is he delights in loving kindness. And all those who come and say, God, I'm sorry, I've not put you in your proper place. I've not recognized your greatness, your majesty. I'm sorry, forgive. This is what I want to do. This is what I want to be. That's a request that God hears, shows mercy, and gives grace. So let's take a minute and let's do just exactly that. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come before you, our great God. And I do bow my heart and my head. And very willingly, Father, I bow my knee before you. Because you are God and there's nobody like you. Heaven and earth exist because you wanted it to. You made things for your pleasure. I exist because you created me. And so, my God, I come before you and I bow before you and I acknowledge that you are worthy. And I give you praise, God. You are a great God. And honor, Father, what you want has preeminence. That's the deciding factor, what you want. And my life, my God, belongs to you. For you're worthy. And if you allow good into my life, then I'll praise you. And if difficulty is in my path, then you're still worthy and I will praise you. Lord, help each of us to live from this platform, from this point, that you are worthy. And I ask it on behalf of these, my brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around, please. I wonder how many this morning would say by an uplifted hand.